Hi folks, and welcome to Open Analysis Live. So today we're gonna to talk about packers or cryptors and what they look like from the malware developer's point of view. So in our videos, we've talked a lot about how to unpack malware, but we haven't really gone into what is the actual cryptor? What does it look like? And when you're trying to pack a piece of malware, what does that look like? Personally, I have a affinity for these sort of old packers, what they look like, um, you know, the weird panel art and stuff like that. I think it's fascinating. So I'm gonna take you guys through looking at Aegis Cryptor, which is an older cryptor that was popular around 2015, 2016 or so, and then it kind of fell off. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of mm, low level or non-sophisticated malware being packed with it uh, back in the day. And of course, I found a, an old crack copy, so we're going to take a look at that. But before we dive into that, a few updates. So I know that we haven't posted a video since our last one before DEF CON, but uh, just because we haven't been posting videos doesn't mean we haven't been busy. Sean and I will both be doing a workshop at BrewCon in Ghent and Hack in Luxembourg this October. So if you guys are in the neighborhood, if you're going to the conferences, uh, definitely come by and say hi. I think the workshops are full, but you can get on the standby still. And there's plenty of other excellent workshops. Uh, I think BrewCon and HackLoo are, are probably our favorite conferences to go to. Uh, we've been going there for four years now, and I highly recommend it if you're in the area. Those conferences, they definitely focus on the learning aspect, and there's a lot of free tutorials, free workshops, stuff like that. So highly recommend. And also a small update, if you guys have been following our channel for a while, you know that we've been working on a side project, which is why we haven't been posting our videos too often. And I can tell you that that side project is definitely uh, moving along. So hopefully within the next couple months, we'll be able to show you guys uh, what we've been working on. I think you'll be excited. So definitely stay tuned for that. At this point in the video, I would try and promise that we're going to do more videos, but uh, just given the time balance between the conferences and, and this project that we're working on, I think we probably are going to be going down to like one video a month or something like that. I did see a commenter post um, from one video a week to one video a month uh, cry face and uh, unfortunately that's that's the way it's gonna have to be uh, we will ramp back up once we have more time but just for the time being it's gonna be uh, you know it's gonna be kind of slow going so with that uh, let's take a look at this cryptor so the way that I found this is when Sean and I were building our workshop for DEFCON we were thinking of like using an old packer from like an old hack forums post to encrypt one of the payloads that we're using we just thought it'd be kind of fun and it didn't work out because they're so um, unpredictable in the way that they work. We didn't want to give something that would break on some operating systems. So we ended up not using these. But while I was searching, I found this Aegis Cryptor and I just, uh, I really wanted to make a video about it because I think it's really interesting. So this is an old cracked copy I found sitting around on a forum. And so let's just open it up here and we'll take a look at this amazing art from uh, 2016. So here's what it looks like if you're going to actually pack uh, a file or encrypt a file. Now the main purpose of Cryptor especially cryptors like this, are to bypass antivirus checks. So what they want to do is they want to make the stub or the piece of code that actually unpacks and executes their payload, they want to make that as benign looking as possible so that antivirus won't flag it. And they want to make it unique. So they want to generate one stub per release of their malware so that the uh, antivirus signatures aren't going to apply to it. Now, this kind of backfires in the case of these mass-produced cryptors where if people aren't paying attention to what they're doing and they use the stub that ships with the cryptor to encrypt their file, well that stub's already being used by other malware authors so uh, you end up with a lot of detections immediately. So really the way to use this properly is to build your own stub, a custom stub, and then use that to, to pack the malware. I'll show you guys what this looks like in a minute but before we get into that I just want to refresh your memory on what I'm talking about when I talk about a stub. So a lot of the time when you are packing a piece of malware you end up with a small piece of code and you end up with an encrypted section that contains the payload. And this small piece of code is called the stub. And what it does is it kind of unpacks or decrypts that payload and then transfers execution over to it. And of course, in the stub, you can add different features um, for your packer. So you could add different types of encryption. Uh, in this case, there's some options to do some anti-analysis stuff or uh, anti-virtual machine stuff. You can add these different features in. Lots of different cryptors or packers use different, uh, different selling features <laughs> depending on uh, their target market. But in this case, it was pre it's pretty basic. There's also the option, so in this one, there is the option to store the encrypted payload at the end of the file as an overlay. So this means after the PE file is 
finished, they actually append the encrypted section or to use it as, or to append it as a resource. So you can add it as a resource here, which it's not working because I haven't loaded anything up, but um, we'll, we'll probably use it as a resource, in which case they'll put the payload in the resource of the PE file. So the way to use this, you're gonna have to set the file path to the payload that you wanna encrypt. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an encrypted calc.exe. So it's benign. And that way, if you guys wanna play around with this, I'll put a link to the packed sample below and you can play around with it and not worry about being affected by any malware. I would note that there's actually a hidden feature in this uh, cryptor, which they don't note, uh, which is that they set a run key for the malware uh, or for the payload, I guess, which they don't note here. They do copy this over the temp folder and they create a link in the Windows startup folder. So that is going to auto run if you run it on your machine. But of course, I'm just packing calc.exe, so it's not a big deal. You know, you're pretty safe. So let's grab calc.exe and we're gonna grab it out of C, Windows, System32, calc.exe. And we'll just copy it and paste it onto the desktop for now. And now we can choose a path to uh, calc.exe. And normally if you were a malware author, this would be the path to your malware payload. For the stubs, we are going to use the stub that it shipped with. So it shipped with one default stub. And remember, if you use the default stub, chances are that somebody else has made the mistake of using the default stub instead of compiling their own. So it's probably gonna be marked as malicious by antivirus vendors. And I'm actually gonna show you guys this in a minute. It's kind of funny. They'll probably mark our calc.exe as malicious when we upload it. So okay to that. We can actually customize the icon of the payload. So we can kind of make it look like something special. So for our sample, I want to make it look like, what do I want to make it look like? Let's choose something from our program files here. Let's make it look like uh, an Adobe Reader. So let's choose uh, the Adobe Reader here. So we'll add that icon. And I'm just going to choose a random key and I'm going to choose a random mutex for it. And I'm going to, I'm not going to use the virtual PC Rebox and EVM because it's kind of a pain. I do want to show you guys that in a video, but it's very much like the other video we posted on anti-analysis debugging with Ida. So I'll link to that as well. The way that you bypass this protection is, is pretty much identical. You have to jump into their shell code or their position independent code where they do the check and you have to null it out. So it's a little bit of a pain and I don't want to add anything to this because really what I want to talk about is the packing aspect of it. So we're, we'll keep the anti-sandboxy stuff and like I said, we want to make it a resource of the PE file and that's about it. So this special startup bypass defense thing is kind of funny. I think <laughs> I think what they're trying to do is if you don't enable this, they do self-injection. So they inject the payload into a memory section in their own process and run it. If you have this check, then uh, what they do is they inject it into a process that they open. So they create a new process and inject it. So we're gonna keep that check because it kind of makes it easy and fun to uh, show how this works. And then we're gonna protect it. So. Uh, uh, they have this this silly little thing where you have to agree that you're not going to use it for illegal purposes, even though it's advertised in all these hacking forums. So, I mean, all right. They don't want you to upload it to uh, Virus Total or any of these scanning engines because they don't want the signatures developed for their stub. Um, so you have to agree to all this stuff. And then we're going to dump it out to the desktop. So, of course, we're not going to abide by this. This stuff is, uh, oh, we're going to change the name to Aegis Pact and... Uh, Save it to the desktop. Okay, so here is our payload. So you can see it has a nice Adobe um, <laughs> icon on it. And uh, one of the resources is gonna contain calc.exe. And of course the main code is going to be the stub. So uh, I can show you guys what that looks like in a minute. What we're gonna do now is we're going to pop over to our debugging VM and I'll show you guys what this PE file actually looks like. Okay, so I've copied over that pack file to our debugging VM. And our debugging VM is set up the same way as the OLED labs box starter vm that uh, we showed in the last video and again i'll link to that below if you guys want to set up a vm just like this so the first thing i'm going to do is show you guys what this file looks like in pe bear so if we open it up here and we look at our resources we're going to see we have a uh, pretty big resource <laughs> sitting here which is always a good indication that uh, there's something interesting in there if you have a giant resource of the pe file and of course we know because we packed it that that's where our calc.exe file is and then i guess the next thing we 
can do is probably look at it in x64 debug and we'll use the same techniques that I've showed before for other malware to unpack it. And hopefully as we unpack it, it'll sort of give you guys an idea of uh, connecting like what we're doing when we're unpacking it with what the malware author did to actually pack the file. So uh, hopefully they'll kind of put the two together. So we're gonna open up uh, x64 debug, which is x32 debug, because we're on a 32-bit VM. So I'm gonna just copy this over. And now that it's loaded, we're gonna do our famous breakpoint tricks. So I'm gonna set one breakpoint on create process internal W, so that if it creates a process, we know to take a look at what's going on in case there's some injection in the process. And one breakpoint on the return call from virtual alloc. And of course, the return from virtual alloc is going to store the newly allocated memory section address in EAX. So when we return from it, we can take a look at those memory sections in our little dump here. So now that that's loaded up, we'll set a breakpoint on create process internal. So we use the BP command, create process internal W, make sure to capitalize the right letters. And then we want to press control G, type in virtual alloc and jump to virtual alloc. And then as I've shown in other videos, this is just a wrapper for the virtual alloc function. So we need to follow this jump here, just highlight it, press enter. There's another jump, highlight, enter. And then we see the return is here. So we just uh, right click on the return and toggle a breakpoint. So now we have a breakpoint on create process internal W and a breakpoint on the return from virtual alloc. And so now that we have that, we can start running. Of course, we break on the entry point as always, and then uh, let's continue running. So we break on the return from um, virtual alloc and so we can right click on this address which is the allocated memory section and follow and dump and of course there's nothing in there just yet because it's just been allocated but if we continue to run we're going to see it write something in here now here's the trick we can see here that they've written a pe file into this memory section so we see the mz uh, we see the dos and uh, string here but in other videos we have dumped this out because we know that this is the actual payload but in this case they actually read in their own pe file in order to extract the payload out of it. So this is actually the file that's run. It reads itself into memory. And I know this because I ran through this once before, but if you didn't know that, what you could do is you could dump it out and you could compare it to the file that we're debugging. So why don't we do that just to show you guys what it looks like. Um, so we'll right click follow in memory map and right click and uh, dump and we'll dump it to the desktop. Now what you can do is you can open up your hex editor here and copy it over. And then if you were to take a look here at the first section, the code from the first section here, uh, 55 AB. And then if you were to open up our parent file in here and you were to look at the code from the first section here, you can see that it is, well here, let's get it lined up so that when we flip back and forth, you can really see the difference. So we line it up at three F zero and line it up at three F zero. So look at this, when we flip between them, there's no difference, right? So you can see they're the exact same file um, and of course, if this was a different file, you would see this would change or I would notice that there is uh, bytes changing. But of course, we're flipping between them. You can see that it's identical. So we know that that is actually not what we're looking for when we're unpacking this. We know this is actually the uh, parent file or the, the file that's being debugged. However, why have we stopped? Uh, we stopped because we hit this breakpoint here. So we know that there's another uh, memory section that we need to take a look at. So let's just right click, follow and dump, and we'll just continue the process and see if something interesting shows up here. Uh, this looks like maybe it's some code, but it's not a PE file. And we've broke on return from virtual alloc. So there's another memory section that we want to follow and dump. Let's follow it and dump two though. So we keep this one around just in case we need it. So let's continue our execution here. Uh, we can see that we've actually written something in here uh, that looks like a PE file. Looks like maybe it's the same PE file again. So maybe it copies itself into memory twice, <laughs> interesting enough. And we have broken on the return from virtual alloc. So let's follow this again in dump three and we'll continue our execution. So now we have another P file written here, but this time we've called create process internal. So that means that they're gonna start another process. So the thing to do now is to take a look at this P file and see if this P file is the one that we're debugging or if it's a new one. If it's a new one, maybe it's the calc.exe that we packed. So let's do a follow in uh, memory and then we'll dump this out to file on the desktop, desktop, save. And let's open this up in a hex editor. And we can already see something's a little bit different here. We can see the different number of sections, but I'll just show you guys in case you didn't catch that. So if we look here, uh, we have uh, text data resource sections. 
Here we have text our data data resource. So we can tell already that this is uh, going to be a different file than the, the one that we're debugging. So maybe this is calc.exe. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick find for calc. And uh, yeah, so the PDB string, uh, this is the debug string, is calc.pdb. So we've dumped out the uh, calc exe, and so there we go. <laughs> uh, pretty simple to unpack this. And of course, if we were to continue execution here, what I would expect to see is I would expect to see this process that they're creating be created suspended, and then I would expect them to copy from this memory section here uh, that contains the payload PE, I would expect them to copy it into the uh, created process and then resume execution, just a standard run PE type uh, injection. So that's what I would expect to see. I'm not gonna go through that because of course, if you were unpacking this, you would already be complete. You would already be finished because you had the payload here. And hopefully this has been kind of interesting to show you guys what it looks like from the malware developer's point of view and then what it looks like from our perspective. So when I uh, packed this, I chose the easiest options. I chose like a resource file instead of it being appended to the end of the file, and I chose no anti-analysis or no anti-VM selections. But what I'll do is I will also upload this cracked version of AegisCrypt to Malshare. So if you guys wanna download it and play around with it, uh, you can, and I would encourage you guys to try out the anti-VM detections. So remember when we hit our virtual alloc the, or the second time, sorry, and we had a bunch of uh, code written in here, what I said was, I thought was code. This is actually the the staging code that is used to unpack the resource that contains the payload and do this create process uh, injection. So another thing you could do is you could dump this out and you could take a look at it in IDA and see if you can reverse engineer that. It's also kind of interesting. I might post a follow up video where I walk through that, but it's quite a bit longer than doing this quick unpacking technique. And of course, if you're doing this in the wild, you really just want to unpack the file. You don't want to kind of mess around um, in the stages that lead up to unpacking it. So that's why I skipped over that. But again, it might be interesting for us to look at just for the sake of what does a packer actually look like. So uh, hopefully you guys found this interesting, just a quick video. And as always, if you have any comments or questions about the video, uh, leave them in the comments below. We're always happy to respond. And I know that we've talked to a lot of you over email. Uh, there's lots of questions about where the videos, where our videos and stuff like that. So hopefully it's kind of cleared up. Um, just we're busy. We haven't uh, abandoned this account or anything like that. And remember to subscribe. If you haven't subscribed down below, um, hopefully YouTube will notify you if you're subscribed. I'm not really sure because we don't post videos too often, so they're not very good at notifying you, but give it a try. Maybe it'll work and then that way you won't miss our next video when it comes out. So I would say until next video, <laughs> let's just leave it open. Uh, no date set. Remember to keep exposing mechanics behind the malware and stay curious.